ich würde gerne ein wenig auf die Vorgeschichte dieser gezielten Tötungen eingehen. Und die haben ja eine lange Vorgeschichte, speziell wenn man in die USA schaut. Und da wäre unser äh, Gast aus den USA. Äh, vielleicht äh, würde ich ihn fragen, ob all das, was in den 50er, 60er Jahren passiert ist, also ich denke da an die Geschichte in Föhn. Also es gab ja zwei verschiedene Art von gezielten Tötungen. Massentötung, also wo es Listen gab von Kommunisten in Indonesien, die dann zu Zehntausenden umgebracht wurden. Und die Listen waren mit Hilfe, wie sich ja inzwischen fest herausgestellt hat, mit Hilfe der USA hergestellt worden. Es gab die Aktion in Vietnam Phoenix wo auch Zehntausende umgebracht worden sind, was ja letztlich auch eine Art gezielter Tötung war, weil es genau Vorgaben gab. Es gab Guatemala, die äh, damals äh, den Putsch äh, fünf, äh, 1954, jetzt habe ich es, äh, den, den Putsch, wo auch die CIA, die inzwischen also äh, Veröffentlichungen zeigen, also Dokumente der CIA zeigen, äh, äh, tausende von Namen vorgegeben hat, die dann bei diesem Putsch getötet werden sollten. Und dann gab es ja eine andere Art gezielter Tötung, das war die Tötung von ähm, politischen Führern der anderen Länder. Und da gab es ja einen äh, großen Senatsausschuss äh, äh, von Senator Church, äh, der äh, Mitte der 70er Jahre äh, das auch klargelegt hat und bewiesen hat, was da los gewesen ist, dass, dass die Regierungen mithilfe der CIA versucht haben, Leute umzubringen wie Lumumba zum Beispiel, als, um den als erstes zu nennen, die Gebrüder Castro, Che Guevara, dann auch eigentlich liebe Freunde der USA wie Diem und Trujillo, Trujillo sogar im Auftrag von äh, Präsident Kennedy, auch ein demokratischer Präsident, oder auch, äh, äh, oder auch die Tötung oder den Mord, wenn man so will, an, an Generalstabschef Schneider in, äh, in Chile. Also es gibt eine riesen Vorgeschichte dieser Sache jetzt hier und jeder, der sich damit beschäftigt, weiß natürlich auch, dass damals nach diesen Senats äh, Untersuchungen, äh, äh, Präsident Ford als erster und dann alle folgenden Präsidenten einen UKAS erlassen hat, ähm, äh, der verbot, dass solche Tötungen durchgeführt äh, werden und nach, nach 9-11, einen Tag danach, äh, Bush äh, gesagt hat, das ist jetzt erledigt, das ist aufgehoben und jetzt können wir wieder. Also ich finde schon, diese Vorgeschichte ist sehr interessant, weil ich das so ein bisschen auch einordne, diese, diese ganze Geschichte. Und meine Frage jetzt an den, äh, an den amerikanischen Freund wäre, spielt das denn überhaupt noch eine Rolle in den USA? Also das, diese Vorgeschichte. Um, thank you. That is extremely important context for this discussion. Uh, there is no question that from its inception, Uh, after World War II, the CIA has committed and supported massive crimes against humanity, uh, including its own assassinations abroad in clandestine operations, and including supporting regimes that carried out mass murder during the Cold War. Uh, that history is known, not as known as it should be in the United States. Uh, certainly, as you pointed out, in the 1970s, much of this was brought to light uh, in Congress, but Americans have a very short memory uh, for these things. Um, I wonder what you think about this point that I'm going to make now, um, that there is a difference, and maybe it's not an important difference, but there is a difference between those kinds of activities that are carried out clandestinely, that are not publicly acknowledged, um, whose legality is never discussed, that are denied, uh, and what we've seen in the last 10 years, which is essentially uh, the United States legal system enshrining these practices within our law. 
uh, and saying, this is okay. Uh, we can do this. We can even acknowledge this. We can do this publicly. Uh, it probably makes no difference to the tens of thousands of people in Guatemala lying in mass graves and ditches whether the United States government acknowledges its role or not. Uh, and it probably makes no difference uh, to the families of people, of civilians who are killed uh, in Pakistan, whether it's acknowledged or not. Uh, but I think that there is a special danger uh, to the democracy in what's going on uh, right now, uh, in some sense in the open, uh, that the Bush administration and then the Obama administration have claimed in courts the authority to define a global battlefield, to articulate an armed conflict that takes place everywhere, that could last forever. Uh, so I, I take your point. It's a very important point. Um, I, I'm not naive. I do not share the, you know, the view that you hear, the very shallow view that you hear in the United States that 9-11 changed everything. Of course it didn't. Um, but, but remember how insulated and isolated most Americans were from American violence before 2001. This is all things that happened in the middle sections of newspapers and only left-wing newspapers. You didn't have to know about any of this. It didn't have to affect anyone's lives. Um, and there was an immediacy after September 11th uh, and uh, really a naivete on the part of, Amer on the part of Americans that, uh, that what had happened to the United States was different than anything that had ever happened anywhere else. Right? Um, and that it justified a response that you know, required the whole world to join the United States in a war. Um, I, I, so, so I do think that this development is dangerous in a different way. Uh, than the very important history that you just brought up. Just uh, for a second. I agree what you said because uh, obviously it was illegal and now they say it is legal, so it got worse. Right, yes. Yeah, look, the CIA, this is being recorded, right? I, it's a criminal organization, right? I mean, it exists to break the law. Uh, it is sent throughout the world to break the law. Uh, and it's done so a little bit more openly. I mean, again, they're trying to hide it still. But yeah, sorry for what <laughs> little remark. Um, but as I see it, the CIA, okay, is a criminal organization. But I mean, they didn't do that on their own. They always President Eisenhower, uh, the whole National uh, Security Council, and all these presidents said, yes, you should do that. And that's not the CIA, it's a little bit higher. No, that's correct. This is the, the policy of the national security state since World War II, is to advance American interests abroad, utterly irrespective of human rights violations. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, 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 you actually know the history better than I know. <laughs> Etwas naive Frage, aber wenn es da nicht Krieg ist, dann werden auch Kriegsgefangene gemacht. Und ähm, die Frage ist dann, bleiben die bis zum Ende des Krieges nun gefangen? Oder was ist es eigentlich für ein Status, den, den diese Gefangenen besitzen? Bekommen die dann eine zeitliche Strafe? Oder ja, es ist mir völlig unklar, was mit denen eigentlich, was sie für einen Status haben. Yeah, well, maybe you can. I, I can try. It's an extremely important question again. Uh, and what I can tell you is that the position of both the Bush administration and the Obama administration with respect to people who are held at Guantanamo um, is that they can be held under the laws of war without trial until the cessation of hostilities in the armed conflict against Al-Qaeda. Now, what does that mean? Uh, now, you can say that we didn't know how, we didn't know when previous wars would end. We didn't know in 1942 when World War II would end. But at least we knew how it would end. Uh, if you're talking about a war against a loosely organized transnational terrorist organization, it's not going to end with a peace treaty. It's not going to end with a victory on the battlefield. 
In fact, both administrations are claiming the right to detain these prisoners indefinitely. Uh, that is forever, or until the administrations decide that they want to release them. Now, I think the Obama administration at least understands that this is a problem. Uh, so what they have done is they have adopted voluntary executive branch guidelines to assess every year or two whether the detainees are still dangerous, uh, and if they're deemed not to be dangerous anymore, they can be released. But the legal position that they're taking is that if they were captured in connection with the war against Al-Qaeda, then they can be detained until the end of hostilities, which in this case is a distant abstraction uh, rather than something that we understand. And maybe never. Well, maybe never. But actually, uh, there is a case right now in connection with the German who was killed in Pakistan. There is a criminal investigation, and the local prosecutor has to make a decision in investigating this, what legal framework applies. Um, whether Germany is engaged in a non-international armed conflict in Afghanistan, or whether there is no armed conflict in Afghanistan. Uh, and I can say that, I can predict, either one of these decisions will be controversial. Um, but if, German, if, if this prosecutor takes the position that Germany is not involved in an armed conflict, um, there will be huge problems with the United States. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm quite <laughs> confident that it will reach the opposite conclusion, that there is an armed conflict, and they won't be able to continue to dodge this question in the way absolutely they have for the last seven years. Yeah. Yeah. So let me tell you what would be helpful from where I sit. Uh, I, I think there is a misconception that the United States government doesn't care what other countries think. <coughs> of its policies. Uh, and I think that's profoundly untrue. Uh, I think you saw this with the way the rendition program was exposed and the way the roles and cooperation of so many countries in Europe uh, came to light. I think you saw this if you looked at the WikiLeaks cables um, with US diplomats running around the world trying to ensure continued cooperation, uh, even though the public in Europe had turned against uh, many of the anti-terrorism policies. So I think the message from Europe to the United States, uh, and it begins with you to your elected officials, um, is that we've now had 10 years to look at the American approach to this. Um, and it hasn't just been a moral catastrophe, it's been a strategic catastrophe. That we haven't ended terrorism, we've grown terrorism. Um, that we have not respected the law, we've shredded the law that we haven't made the world a safer place, we've made the world a less safe place. Uh, and that it's now a time for all of us to take a step back, to take a deep breath, uh, and to question whether this militarization of counterterrorism, uh, which should be cabined as a law enforcement issue, uh, has been effective. Uh, and the way to give that strength, the way to give it muscle, um, is through cooperation or lack of cooperation. Uh, and you know, when the United States insists on using military commissions at Guantanamo, on the possibility of the death penalty, uh, you see some countries saying we cannot deport, we cannot extradite someone to a country who's going to face a legal system like that. Well, I think you need to start thinking about cooperation in those terms. And I don't suggest that targeted killing is exactly parallel, because as I said before, uh, it is not the case that every time it's carried out, the law is broken. Um, but I do think that it's part of a pattern um, that the U.S. has practiced and has, in some sense, imposed on the rest of the world uh, that's a dangerous pattern um, of you know, giving more power over life and death uh, to executive decision makers rather than to courts. And it's a very important question. We, we, we just talked about people who are released from Bagram prison or from Guantanamo. You know, even with trials, we make mistakes. A uh, hundred people in the United States in recent years have been released from death row after having been sentenced to death after trials. We make mistakes. Uh, and if we're going to take the right to life seriously, uh, then uh, we can't simply you know, fire missiles anywhere in the world where we're afraid someone is up to no good. Um, and that's a message that the United States needs to hear, not just from 
uh, human rights lawyers in America, but from allies and partners around the world.